Welcome to the Weekly Mark. Today we'll be having a chat with the businesswoman who has shattered the glass ceiling in the tech wall, Anna Schlegel. Our reporter Umberto has been out into the streets to find out how Catalans propose. And stay for the funniest TV quiz around. Guess what? With Sergi Cervera. This is the Weekly Mac, your TV show in English, hosted by Marcella Topor. Hello and welcome to our show. And let's kick off with words and facts brought by today's uh, collaborators, uh, Matthew Tree, Mario Serra, and Umberto Gonzalez. Welcome Hello. all. Hello. Thank you for coming. And today we'll be talking about the English translation of a very, very special book with uh, Matthew Tree. And when it comes to Catalan literature, we should be talking about the book. The book, right, Matthew? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's probably the biggest single contribution made by Catalan culture to international literature, not just to lo local literature, to international literature. And that's a fact that was ignored by English publishers and translators for centuries. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's quite impressive. Well, anyway, it's just as well that luckily we have with us uh, the author of its uh, latest uh, adaptation to Catalan. We have the book here. <laughs> we are talking, of course, about uh, Tiran uh, Lublanc and the author is Marius Serra. We'll take the chance to ask him, to ask Marius a couple of questions too, because he's an Enigma expert as much as a writer. <laughs> Of course, there are lots of enigmas in literature and in language in Tirán Lo Blanc, but we'll talk about it later on. Yeah, can't First, wait. we've got uh, our enigma last uh, last week's guess word, and if you remind, I remind you the clue. Yes, it please. It was a holy hair monk. Mm -hmm. It was a four-letter word. A who a woolly haired monk, but I know you maybe have an idea, but you have to wait, mams the word, because uh, <laughs> people can uh, have a little bit, uh, uh, some minutes to think about it and crack it, okay? Yeah, I mean, our lips hour. are sealed, <laughs> right? Our lips are sealed, and until then, we'll also have Umberto's report, which is about, Umberto? Proposals. How do Catalans propose marriage to someone else? The results of these proposals, and most importantly, if Umberto proposed marriage to somebody during the interviews, because you know how that goes. Uh, <laughs> let's take a little peek right now. Have you ever told anybody that you love them? Uh, yes, of course. And did they say yes back? They say no, always, all the time. And the passion, you actually say, oh, I love you, and then you go yeah, like, oh, no, no. Say, oh, wow, no, I'm, it is a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone far away from here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together 17 years, something like that, and I prepared a book of the 70 reasons for what I want to marry with you. 17 years together before being married? Yeah. Crazy. What, did you think you were gay and you couldn't get married? <laughs> I had a ring for you. It so. will be impossible, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, so you didn't find uh, any fingers to put your ring on that? Oh, I may have, though. It's a little bit hard with Danny. He actually uh, <laughs> blocks me. I think he doesn't want me to get married. So uh, you're going to see that on the second part. Uh, and okay. some romanticism, too. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Well, we'll see in a few minutes what kinds of proposals Catalans uh, make. But first things first, let's go over to Matthew, who is going to talk about this great medieval classic that's still read today. Right, Matthew? Yeah, I'm kind of hoping that people don't automatically switch off or disconnect as soon as yeah, they hear the words me medieval Please classic. Please don't, because this is really, really interesting. <laughs> it is. It I is. Promise. It's a very interesting Stay book. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. It's this book, Tirando Blanc, it's now considered now considered to be the very first European novel of the of the modern era. It's quite interesting because it was written in, in Catalan in 1464, but it wasn't published uh, in Catalan until 1490 when it appeared in Valencia. It was reprinted in Barcelona in 1497, and it was then translated into Spanish and Italian in the 16th century, which is when Cervantes read it, by the way. And since then, since then, it's been translated, and I need the list in front of me here, French, Polish, Russian, Dutch, German, Swedish, Finnish, Danish, Romanian, Tagalog, the Philippine language, <laughs> Japanese, and Chinese. And also, as you mentioned earlier, thanks to Marius here, it's also been 
translated in inverted mm -hmm. commas into modern Catalan as yes. opposed to we 15th have, uh, century Catalan. His masterpiece here with us. It's uh, quite heavy, by the way, <laughs> also. Yeah. Well, well, and we are lucky enough and privileged uh, today to have uh, Marius here. We'll uh, talk about. Uh, uh, his work. Uh, but before that, Marius, how many adaptations uh, are there in Catalan? There are lots of them, in fact, because uh, they, uh, they are, um, students have some uh, excerpts of Tiran Le Blanc, for instance, only love uh, chapters mm -hmm. or maybe war chapters. Uh, but even there are uh, beautifully adapted uh, like this by oh. Maria Aurelia Camani. Really, these are comics. Yeah, these comics this are really quite old. They they come they are from the 70s, and uh, they were in four volumes, but they were quite popular. Mm -hmm. Tirant Le Blanc. There, there are other adaptations in comics in Valence uh, by a Valencian drawer um, called Cento in the 90s because it was then when it was the 500th anniversary, right? But uh, the thing is that it's quite difficult for a Catalan contemporary reader to read it in the original version, which is medieval and it's um, a little bit yes. uh, hard. A to great way understand. to to um, encourage students to uh, read the classic, right? Yeah, of course. This is like uh, the beginning. Uh huh. Right. That's why I'm excited to read your your version because I've had a hard time reading the uh, classics because of the medieval writing. But I have a question for you about adaptations. These ad adaptations, hmm. do they vary uh, or stray away from the original? Um, you know how some adaptations can, uh, instead of having someone killed off or married, they will uh, do something different? No. No, they stick no. to the mm -hmm. original script. We, we are talking about rewriting, in fact. Uh, okay. So that you are just adapting uh, words because of context, names of things, mm -hmm. and maybe a sort of rhetoric which is okay. medieval. But of course, it's the, the whole, the original and whole uh, 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 novel, okay. right? It's not an adaptation like this that maybe you are just uh, making very, in very another short. language, mm -hmm. right? Shorter and uh, with uh, script. Okay. Or maybe at the cinema, there's a bad cinema adaptation mm -hmm. of Tiralo Blanc, by the way. But okay. Okay. okay, now Matthew, I was paying attention and I heard almost every language except for English. What is that all about? Are you trying to tell me that there hasn't been an English version? No, I was just saving that for last. Oh, uh, you were trying to check. <laughs> yeah. You were just yeah, yeah. checking, uh, just if checking. you pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's an English translation, definitely. Um, it came out in 1984, uh, the first one, and it had a, a huge impact. It had a huge impact. The Times Literary Supplement gave it a, a complete double-page spread. And as the translator himself told me very proudly in the tabloid newspaper, that's a very popular newspaper that sells over a million copies every day, the Daily Mirror, it was number four in their wow. bestseller list was this first English translation of Tidane. Tiran That's quite uncommon. Oh, right? it sold really well. <laughs> the, this is the American hardback edition, but there was also an American paperback edition for airports. Uh, I mean, it Amazing. really, it cheaper, really, a cheaper, yeah, a cheaper right. edition. So, who was the translator in this case? Uh, a very interesting guy, actually, called David H. Rosenthal. He was from New York, and he was a published poet. He was a jazz expert. He published several books on jazz. He wrote columns for jazz magazines. And he just had a personal interest, it was a purely personal interest, in Occitan and Catalan medieval literature. And he read Tiran Lo Blanc in the original, and he said this has to appear in English. It was, he was like a one-man band in that wow. sense. So he eventually, um, well, I suppose persuaded a publisher to go ahead with the, uh, uh, with the project. And so it was thanks to David that um, Tiran Lo Blanc appeared on the international map. Mm -hmm. uh, it was thanks to him that everybody discovered that Cervantes had called Tiran Lo Blanc the best book in the world and wow. that it had been a big influence on him when he wrote what in English is called Don Quixote. Don Quixote. <laughs> it's called Don Quixote <laughs> in English. Quixote. 
And Rosenthal translated this book amazingly when he was just 39 years old. Five years later, he was given the Creu de San Jordi, this New Yorker, wow. for having done this translation and other books by uh, Mercé Rodoreda, Victor Catala, and very sadly, David died at the age of 47 of cancer. Uh, he was a great guy and um, is still very much missed by, by those of us who knew is, him. Is there a plaque at uh, the Plaza of uh, Tirantlo Blanc in Barcelona about uh, this guy? Because I think there probably should be. Mm. I don't think yeah. there is, but yes, there should be. Yeah, yeah. there should be. So what is it about this 500-year-old book that it's still attractive even today, nowadays, Amarius, for, for the readers. Yeah, I, I agree to, uh, with Matthew because um, this realism uh, means that it's not just um, a, a story about heroes, about knights doing heroic things, but um, Joanot Martorell comes into a real daily life of everybody. So you are mm, with them when they are eating, when they are making love, when they are crying even, right? When they are strong and when they are feeble. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a novelty at that time. It, it came to a new uh, sort of view from the literary point of view. Nowadays, it seems quite usual that intimacy is in literature, mm -hmm. but in medieval times it was a question of just heroic things and uh, of the knights uh, fighting. So that's a thing that uh, an, a contemporary reader finds uh, that, uh, well, th these are real characters. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, why not? A Game of Thrones, a second Game of Thrones. Uh, I hope Netflix uh, heard you. Uh, yeah. Humberto, <laughs> you never know. And now let's dig into English language with the Marius and uncover the ins and outs of popular idioms and these are today's expressions. Have a look. My favorite idiom is let someone off the hook because I've been let off with so many things in my, in my time, I'm just eternally grateful. <laughs> what I think is quite interesting is when people mix up two idioms. So we have an idiom, the, the icing on the cake, and then we have a completely separate idiom, which is the cherry on the icing. And it's very easy to get them confused. So the cherry on the cake or the or the icing on the cherry, or, you know, people get in a real mess, even me. And what it really means is just, well, it's the best part of the very best thing. So the, the, the cake is great, but the, but the cherry on the top is even better. So it's really finishing off something perfectly, like this interview. So my favorite idiom is, if you can't stand the heat, get out of mama's kitchen. I ain't standing no mess, honey. This is one of my favorites. I don't like people messing about. I like, just get out of my kitchen. Get out of mama's kitchen. Well, come and see us. Okay, uh, the first one, to let someone off the hook, that is, out of trouble after being in an awkward situation, and that seems to be uh, related to fishing, right? Yeah, that seems to be its origin because fishermen use hooks to fish, right? That's and right. There is also Captain Hook, as maybe you can uh, remember the popular mm -hmm. fictional character created by Barry at Peter Pan. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think there are some more popular idioms uh, involving hooks. For instance, by hook or by crook? You know that uh -huh. one? Nope. Not you? We don't use that one. You don't use that one? Oh, that's I've used it all my so life. So it's British what then? By any means necessary. Oh no, but... we say come hell or high water. That's oh. what we say. Nice. By any means necessary for us in America is come hell or high water. We don't uh -huh. use that. Okay. okay. I, didn't, I always thought it was universal. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. that's a okay. by, Well, in Catalan, we would say, for instance, um, about turnips and cabbages. Per naps or per cols, which yeah. is quite different, but it's the same totally idea. different, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, so. Um, another curious idiom uh, is the informal expression, but difficult for me, maybe you will know, hook, line and sinker. Yes, I always get that one. Right? Well, that means completely, or with everything included, like yeah. in those hotels, right? 
but hook, line, and sinker seems to have a baseball origin. A sinker happens to be a sort of curveball, but I don't understand anything. I'm not uh, used to, to know about baseball, so maybe Umberto can help us. Well, you're fishing in the right pond. That's good. I am going to uh, <laughs> tell you that we do have a lot of idioms in relationship to uh, baseball. For example, uh, let's say you tried to pick up a girl and uh, she turned you down. You struck out. Oh, mm -hmm. oh um, I can understand that. Or yeah. uh, you're trying to provide me with an idea, you're pitching me an idea. So oh. pitch me the idea yeah. that you want to bring up. Yeah, pitching. But the sinker, what, what's a sinker? The sinker is the one that, the thing on the line that sinks the line so that you can actually get, um, it's the metal part that's, ah, that that's sinks. Ah, the metal right. part. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. But wait, I'm not through with the baseball ones. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you no, know, you guys may have to sit down for this one. Well, you guys are already sitting down. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's the bases all relate to sex. The baseball base, bases. Yeah. So if you went to first base, that yeah. means you kissed somebody. If you oh. went to second base, you touched a little bit. Third base, I'm gonna skip. And home run is you had sex. So when, home run. Yeah. So <laughs> in, you don't say that no. in Amer in uh, England. They they play no. cricket. No. They no, play cricket. In, not in England, okay. because, because British English is getting Americanized more and more. <laughs> All this has reminded me of when I accompanied my mum to the hospital for a checkup. And the nurse came round after the checkup and said, "The doctor just wants to touch base with you." And my yeah, mother, exactly. my mother, turned to me and said, "What does she mean?" <laughs> <laughs> we would understand that, yeah. but uh, but yeah, if you oh, right. if you say you went to first base, you okay, usually okay, ask, okay. "What okay. base did you go to?" Okay. It's, it's okay. good to know. It's good <laughs> to know. Anyway, uh, this icing on the cake is uh, easier, right? The icing on the cake, the cherry on top of the cake. Mm -hmm. Well, that was quite funny. That that guy was mixing them. Sometimes it's funny to yeah. mix some idioms, right? But uh, in Catalan, we would talk about la cirareta. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, la guinda. But the thing is to be on the top, to be the, the best thing, right? The main idea. I've got some toppings, some toppings, idiom toppings, and here we'll have the top three. Let's go. First one, yeah. on top of the world. Do you say oh, that? Oh, there's a song of about course. that. Be very happy. <laughs> that's popular, be, be, yeah. That's OK. Mm -hmm. Second one, off the top of my head. Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. Right? Also. That means with thought, without thought. So like this, uh, mm -hmm. very suddenly, right? And the third one is at the top of my lungs or voice. Yeah shouting yes. with all my forces. Exactly. You all use all three? Yes, 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 we do Definitely. use them. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Last but not least, if you can't stand the heat, get out of mama's kitchen. That's quite a teasing idioms, <laughs> meaning <laughs> calling the interlocutor a child or incompetent, maybe? Yes, and it leaves no doubt about its meaning, right? Because uh, it means that if you can't cope, you have to leave uh, the work to someone who can. Uh, this is widely reported as being coined by a US president, right? Harry Truman. Probably, because in England we don't use it at you all. You don't use no. that, oh, use that yeah. one? No. no. Okay. Well, Truman's show, maybe, but Harry Truman uh, said that. It says, curiously enough, I didn't find many idioms involving motherhood, right? Like this one. Uh, apart from being the mother of all battles, for instance, or the mother of all uh, um, wars or whatever, being the best one. You don't know the expression, can I be mother? No. What no. does it mean? Yeah. Can I be mother? This yeah. is actually very uh, sexist. Yeah. Can I be mother is if you're at a table where food needs to be served, you say, can I be mother? It means, can I serve the food you. to everybody? Oh, really? No. Never yeah, heard yeah. it before. I've never heard it. And, yeah. and, and we have one too, which is not a very nice one. Um, we say, uh, he's got a face that only a mother could love. That means oh, right. That oh. <laughs> yeah. It's quite graphic. Yeah, yeah exactly. What about um, something with the mother's apron? To cling to your mother's apron. Oh. Yeah, clinging to, cling to, to your, your mother's, mother's apron. apron. I don't In know other that words, one. To be dependent on. Exactly, not mean? being able to be make your own. Dependent on your mother. To not make to your be, own. Not to be independent. Decisions. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. We don't use that one. 
All right, and but, now I'm really, yes. But sorry. I have a, a question, just a question, because with mothers, there is this sort of intimacy that you call it mother or mum or mamma or mummy. In Catalan as well, we, we have uh, mother, mamma, mummy, or the horrible mamma, right? <laughs> and I want to ask you, how do you call your mothers? Well, how? I, my Cuban side calls my mom mommy. But Mommy's most Americans Cuban. call their moms mom. Just mom. Mom. M -O -M. What about you? M O M. Or as far as it's M U M. Only I had because my mom came from the north of England and it was typical she called her mother, my grandmother, Ma. That was very typical. Ma. Ma. M A. Yeah. And I often got into the habit of, of just uh, when I talked to my mother, I used to call her. Uh, okay, Ma, all right, Ma, that's all right, Ma, oh, that's uh, because I'd always heard that growing up. It, it's mm -hmm. used in the southern states as well. Yeah, no. Yeah. And yeah. in Romanian, how did you...? Yeah. No, in the English, the English equivalent would be mum. Just So it's mom? just okay. mum, like mama. Like. Normal. Nothing uh, special Nothing's... about it. Well, Nothing are, fancy. <laughs> no, but they, they are all these... All languages have this M thing for motherhood, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it's like mum, mummy, mum. <laughs> Okay, Mamma Mia. Yeah, oh. my favorite actually, <laughs> like this one. Uh, I yeah. actually have another book. Another book? Uh, oh my God, God. what's that? In, in fact, uh, yeah, now mine is thicker than yours. And I have to tell you, Marius, that I want you, it's a book about Marius Serra as well, about uh, the um, idioms and other uh, words, yep. but in Catalan. When are you going to do the one in English? <laughs> You've, no, you, you've got That's some examples wow. in English as well. In there, but yes. The main, okay. the main thing is in Catalan, but there are examples in English, Italian, Spanish, and French as well. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very good. I've I've read I've read all of it. Oh, it really? Is, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Well, if this were a competition, Umberto would be the winner, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> yes, he certainly so. certainly surprised us all. I would right, not and now, like to be left out. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for your video about uh, proposals. Umberto, where did you go? Oh, I went to this cute little village, a uh, coastal village named Blanes. Mm -hmm. Oh, Blanes. <laughs> <laughs> and did you find any creative uh, marriage uh, proposals there? Not as many as I uh, wanted to, but I did find uh, something else that I was looking for, which was the result of this, these proposals. So uh, here, here are some. What happened the first time you said I love you to somebody, ladies and gentlemen? Did they say yes or no? And what fun or surprising ways of proposing matrimony would you like to have done to you? Will I propose matrimony today? Let's see what we find first in Blanis. Can you actually marry me? Uh, no. <laughs> how did you first meet your wife? In a discotheque. After how long did she ask you to marry you? Three months. That is quick. I wish I could find somebody like that. One reason was also for tax reasons, to save money. Ah. 50 or 60% of my friends <laughs> drinking something. Do you want to marry with me? Ah, oh, okay, okay. Not romantic, no, no. no. I was working uh, in a disco. He wrote me in a napkin. That he loved you? Yeah. <laughs> Did you write in a napkin back that you loved him? No, sure. <laughs> uh, another one, uh, rent a one big advertisement on the motorway, and he was in a, in a road trip, and you were married, and the next one with me, and then the last one, the name of the both of them. No? Excuse me, did you marry me? Hey, hey, hey. Okay, no. Has anybody proposed to you? I was in the kitchen, I think, and he told me I have to, uh, I have to tell you something. Do you want to marry me? Uh, and I say, wow, it's very strong. Let me think about. <laughs> did, wait, it's did, not romantic. It's not, no, it was romantic. He, he didn't get on his knees. He didn't have pasta. <laughs> Italian guy. No mozzarella. No, no mozzarella. No pizza. No pizza. No, no, no. Just <laughs> Just telling you, you yeah, know, this yeah. is unacceptable, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. No, unacceptable. Three days. Yeah. I left him. You left him? Yeah. Three days after? Three days after, yeah. I left him in the wedding of my sister. I never see him before. Will she say yes or no? Would you marry me? No. No. <laughs> Is it because I'm gay? <laughs> no. It's because I don't like you. <laughs> She just doesn't like me. The day that my mother visited Blanes in the 1973, and the first night my, my father told her, 
uh, do you want to visit Blanes by night? And my mother said, yes. My mother picked up my father. I think that uh, my father uh, looked the car and he fell in love with the car. <laughs> with the car. <laughs> My brother-in-law proposed my, my sister, yeah. I think it's not a good idea, I tell my sister. My brother-in-law is there, if yeah. he, he hear me, he'll kill me. We won't tell him. <laughs> but in this moment, I think my sister with this guy is not the correct, is not good choice. <laughs> but now you like him. Now I, I like him a lot, yeah. Darling, will you marry me? Yes. <gasps> oh my God, I got one. She's adorable, she's gonna marry me and I'm gonna take her to Virginia. <laughs> Love can be full of surprises, ladies and gentlemen, and some Catalans seem to have the same drive, but I have to be honest, I have not seen anything as wild as ours in America. Have you gotten some ideas today? If you do, and you get married, invite me to your wedding, or maybe propose to me. Right. Well, one thing is well. clear, not all declarations are successful. <laughs> so who is the most romantic person you found in Blanas? Okay, I have to tell you, it was that girl with the uh, black hair down to here, the one that I talked about pasta to, with the yeah. Italian in the kitchen. She had me enthralled. I actually uh, entranced everything. I couldn't get my eyes off of her. Uh, her eyes were actually smiling and everything else. It was actually, uh, yeah, I would call her the most romantic one. Wow. I had a straight flashback. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, wait, now I want to ask you guys, how did you guys propose? I don't. You didn't propose to your wife? No, Jesus, no. No, <laughs> I, I, I don't like no. proposing, and I, even worse, I don't like being proposed to. It's like someone points a gun at your head. Yeah. I don't want to do it to anybody, Matthew. and I don't want anybody to do it to me, ever. So when you got married, how did you end up getting married if no one proposed? I don't uh, well, it was a long time ago, but we agreed to get married for reasons of we were together. Okay. But to stay together, we needed to get a stamp on my girlfriend's passport. So uh, we got married so we could get the stamp on the passport. It was a mutual agreement. Very practical agreement. It was very practical. <laughs> don't say any more. <laughs> we, we don't want the FBI coming in here. Okay, what about you? No, I, I love to propose. So how did you propose? Tell us. Do you want me to propose anyone now? No, tell us how you propose oh, to your yeah. wife. Well, but, but not very right. imaginative. Well, well yes, once, no, once, once Marius, yeah. please tell us about that uh, really creative original proposal. Please. Well, because and it was the quite world expensive. needs to know. Quite expensive as and well. expensive as well. Yeah, I rented a <laughs> helicopter. <gasps> That is what I was looking for. <laughs> Those are the, okay. the answers that I was looking for. I read so you wanted to seduce a girl with a yeah. helicopter? By well, we, we, helicopter. yeah, that, that's it, because she was at uh, that time in a village, so that I came with the helicopter to that village for her. Okay, and uh, what well, was it, her reaction? Well, it was, uh, well, she, she ran away. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't work. It was work. quite uh, strong for her. Yeah. It so, was, she was shocked. Yeah, she was shocked. So That's you it. You proposed to her in the helicopter. You didn't jump off the helicopter and said, I'm, I will marry you or anything? No, the helicopter uh, went to, to the earth. And I, yeah. We I, landed. I, okay. we, we landed. We landed. And yeah, she no. came? Right? Well, I, I had to go. <laughs> right. Yeah, she was quite ashamed, I think, uh, with all that in a little village. Uh, did, did you get your money back? <laughs> no. No, because I, I was just flying with the helicopter. That was not a problem, right? Okay. Well, that was, because I, I love to do the sort of things like this, but not just for proposing for marriage, okay. right. but uh, to play. Right. Little. Well, it was her loss. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And now, would you, is there a special way that you would propose to anyone? Marcella, if you had to propose to somebody, would you propose in a certain way? I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't propose. Okay. I, it's just, uh, I get to propose too. Okay. So. I, I can help you. I can help you. you. Tina LeBlanc can help you. Uh -huh. uh, Tina right. LeBlanc has a very nice way of proposing mm -hmm. Carmesina. He tells, well, we, we can act okay. it. Like, uh, actually, okay. with, with this uh, phone, you can imagine, mm -hmm. with a phone, it was not a phone. Uh, he said, I am in love with someone and I'll give you a stamp with, his, with her image. And he gave it to her. And Carmesina take 
you can imagine I go and give you this this is you'll have a picture of my love and when she opened it it was a mirror like if now it could be the camera mm -hmm. I very can tell subtle. you here it's you very are. subtle very subtle I like that I like better that. than just asking her That's for a drink That's the kind of proposal <laughs> I would like you know oh. it's not Tinder it's easier no, no, it's <laughs> Okay. What about Americans, Umberto? Because I think you said that uh, you guys, uh, you Americans, uh, could teach cat yes, they, something about they're it. They're so eccentric with the proposals. It's like Christmas. Remember when I told you that they have to get like a huge Christmas present and so on? They have to go out of their mind to do something very different. And mm -hmm. it's always asked, how did you propose? How did you propose? So you have to actually have something good. And, um, and in fact, um, do you want a demonstration of how I would propose? Yeah, why not? Okay, play it, Sam. Marcella, would you marry me, please? Marry him. Marry him. Marry him. Uh, marry me, please. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a surprise. Yeah. A bit of a, pro a huge <laughs> proposal, but uh, I would, but I'm married, as you know. I know, I know. <laughs> This is something Unless I was do. already married, I would think about it definitely. <laughs> and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Umberto. That but, was a really nice surprise. Yeah. Well, and after declarations and proposals, my next proposal to all of you is for Marius to bring his enigmas, and it's time for the solution to the guesswork. Yeah, and uh, let's begin with the solution of last week's uh, guesswork. It was, the clue was, a woolly haired monk. Four letters. Any okay. idea about that? Mm -hmm. well, f first of all, I just thought monkey. <laughs> it's <laughs> more than four letters. Not I realized four letters. it's not four letters. But then I got it. Then I got I, it. I don't have uh -huh. it, so okay. please share. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Mario, uh, Matthew, sorry, please. I looked up some synonyms mm -hmm. and thought, aha, uh -huh. lama. That's it. It's a Buddhist a lama. <laughs> yeah. And uh, our llama, uh, right, uh, is pronounced that mm -hmm. way in English. Even it has yeah. two L's for this uh, camel-like uh, mm -hmm. uh, animal, yeah. right? Uh, but it's llama. And a precise homophone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's precise. Right? What about next week? Um, next week uh, we'll talk uh, about mountains, right? So. Ranges of mountains for prisoners. Six letters. Ranges of mountains for prisoners. Six letters. This one might be easier. Yeah, I think, I think so. so. <laughs> okay, well, once uh, you crack the guesswork, you can post your answers on the Weekly Mag social media profiles. We'll have the solution next Saturday. And well, this is the end of today's uh, chat. Uh, Matthew, Mario, Umberto, thank you so much. Until okay. next time. Okay. Sometimes old stories are the best ones. This week's book and film recommendations from the Xarxa de Bibliotecas Municipales of the Diputacia de Barcelona are to do with two classic tales well worth a read or viewing. So over to our librarian Salvador Faura and our cinema expert Miquel Lopez from Televisión de Badalona. The Scarlet Letter is a story set in Massachusetts at a time when the United States was still a colony. It's the story of a woman who had to live all her life with an A soon uh, to her dress. And that is because her society obliged her to show that she had been an adulterous woman because she had a baby, the identity of whose father was unknown. I strongly recommend you to read the book so that you know who the father of that child is. That's a big surprise. Alexander the Great is considered to be one of the most influential people in history. He was the king of Macedon and created one of the largest empire of the ancient world. And he was never defeated in any battle. His life has inspired many books, movies and television series, but probably the most famous one is Alexander, directed by the ever-controversial Oliver Stone. His look at Alexander's life is epic, but some critics considered it lacked emotional involvement. For what refers to the cast, Colin Farrell 
plays Alexander, and surprise, surprise, Angelina Jolie is his mother. Other notable actors are Val Kilmer, Anthony Hopkins, and Christopher Plummer. She's from Mulot, but made it all the way to Silicon Valley, California, where she's the big name in the tech world. Don't miss our interview with Anna Schlegel. Our next protagonist is originally from uh, Wales and she came to live in Girona to practice one of her biggest passions, which is cycling. She's only 21, but she's already competing professionally and when she's not adding up the miles and exploring the countryside around the city, she works as a teacher at the Montessori School. Let me introduce you to Sophie Wiley Morris. Hi, I'm Sophie, I'm 21 years old and I'm a teacher and cyclist in Girona. I'm from Wales and uh, the cycling community is big here and my parents saw something here in Girona and we ended up coming on holiday and I fell in love with it. Here in Girona I'm a racing cyclist as well as a teacher but I think when you live in Girona and there's such a big cycling community that your motivation goes crazy and you want to keep up with the boys and try and beat the boys on the bike so my goal this year is to start winning some races and see how, how good I can do. I became a teacher here in Spain because in women's cycling there's no money at the moment which we really really need to push and we need help from everybody to, to, get, this, to get this going even from the men and um, I needed to find a way to stay here and my parents couldn't support me forever so I started looking at jobs and I got the opportunity to become an English teacher and I've been doing that for three years now here. I'm working in Montessori, a, a private school, which is based on, on learning through materials, not exactly classes. They have their own method using materials to help learn, to be outside of the classroom, so the kids aren't restricted to the classroom and they can be free with what they're, what they're learning. And in every classroom, they have an English assistant and a Spanish or Catalan teacher. In Girona there are so many, so many cycling shops, I, I think more than five, more than ten maybe, because the cycling community is growing a lot here. You have people, well, now we're in different circumstances with the coronavirus, but people from America, Italy, Spain, everywhere you can think of coming to Girona because the professionals are here and they want to ride where the professionals ride, they want to drink where the professionals drink, have the coffee and the restaurants where everybody goes and people love to come here for that. I got my first bike when I was probably two because my family loved riding, riding bikes. But a secret that I actually never told anybody, I couldn't ride a bike with two wheels until I was nine years old. And that's really late for in the cycling community, that's really late. And then from 12 years old, I started racing and I've never stopped. So when I started racing, I was racing in the UK. In, when you're younger, you can only race on closed circuits that are no cars, no nothing. And I started going to Belgium when I started getting a bit older and racing in Belgium and in Sweden. And now I've moved to Catalonia. We do races in Catalonia, Spain and in France. Cycling for me is a way to release my problems and, and just something I've fallen in love with. I started very young and, and if I've ever had a problem, you just go on the bike with music or a podcast and you think about your problem and it goes or the problem just goes and you love being out in the fresh air, 
and taking in the scenery and the nature, it's, it's, a, really, it's a really good way to release problems. And our next guest has been uh, recognized as the most influential woman in the tech world. This uh, Catalan executive from Ulot made it to the top of Silicon Valley. She has worked with some of the most important companies and now she is vice president of NetApp, a big data company. And all this while being very active and outspoken in favor of empowerment of uh, women. Her name is Anna Schlegel. Welcome to the Weekly Mag. It's such a pleasure Thank you so much. to have My you here mine. from the US. You're in Catalonia for a few days. Yep. How, uh, how come? Are you enjoying it? I am really enjoying it. You know, I actually came for an event tonight, which is Dona Stick uh, with uh, Joana Barban. And uh, when she proposed that I came to the US, I said, I'm booking the ticket tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Well, uh, Anna, at the end of last year, you were recognized by the influential analytics in Sight Magazine as being the world's uh, most influential woman in uh, technology business. That's a huge achievement. Congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess this didn't happen overnight, right? You, uh, you've been in the uh, US for a long time. You were in your 20s when you arrived. Uh, then uh, you did a lot of good work and now you're on top of the world. <laughs> so <laughs> how, um, how did you manage to achieve all this? It's, a long way. It's, it's a long way, that's right, yes. I always say I'm 53 years old, you know. It doesn't okay. happen overnight. I did arrive in the States in 1992, so it's been a while. What happened is that I, when I went into the States, I apparently hit the ground running very fast. Um, and I had my own startup that led me to work for Cisco Systems, which back then was, I think about 30,000 people. Today, they're about 100,000 people. And I happened to be one of the first people that helped uh, Cisco think of how to go global. Mm -hmm. And so I learned the art of, of going global over there. And then I moved from one company to the next, yeah. Mm -hmm. And languages, um, I know they played a huge uh, role in your career, actually. You yes. studied philology. That's right, yeah. And now you're in tech business. How do these two things marry uh, and combine with, uh, with each other? I think since a very tiny little girl, you know, I'm from Ulot, all Ulot. Um, I always heard French and Catalan and Spanish, and then my family used to spend a lot of summer, well, every single summer on the Costa Brava. And I always heard, I heard Flemish and French and Italian and all these languages. I was fascinated by it. And I, and I think I learned a lot of these languages playing with little kids uh, on the beach. And I would ask them, you know, like, how is it at your school? And so since very little, I've, I've had this passion for languages. Mm -hmm. And then you um, decided to, to study English and German? Well, my dad had a, a vision. I, I remember he came one day when we were very young at home and he said, we're going to all learn French and English because it's, it's the future, you know. And this was yeah. probably in the 70s. And I'm he like, was right. OK, it's the future. <laughs> so we, um, he got us language tutors in Girona. So uh, we all had to go, uh, you know, learn some British English at that time. I remember when I came to the States with a very nice proper British English that uh, went away very fast. But languages are very important, yeah, and, and in fact, that's how I started, right? I started with a... Um, with a, a translation tr company, right? Translation company that... Uh, I, I, I was doing the translations for all these big tech companies, but I used to tell them, like, these translations are not going to help you. What are going to help you is to learn the culture of the other country and to place yourself into the, the psychic of the customer into mm -hmm. another country. And that's how I got hired. Okay, so how do Brazilians think? I said, I don't know, let me go to Brazil, I'll tell you about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about uh, NetApp, the company that you work for, which is one of the, the biggest uh, big uh, data companies? 
with the clients, huge clients, including Fiverr and Apple, for example, and even some uh, governments. So what, sure. what is NetApp exactly? So NetApp started about 27 years ago, and they created some of the first storing storage uh, systems. So the server, okay. the servers, you, you know, those, I think we've seen it in movies that they look like these big fridges where you put filers inside and then the, the storage admins yeah. are Looks placed. Looks a bit like intimidating. The, yeah, like the <laughs> yellow cable goes there and it, it plays with other storage companies mm -hmm. as well. So what NetApp has been very successful at doing or what we're trying to do right now is pass from this physical hardware into data centers that are more software driven. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing is we're working with the hyperscalers such as Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, and we're offering our software services to them. Okay, right. And so maybe a company thinks that they're using Google Cloud or you know AWS Cloud or mm -hmm. Azure from Microsoft Cloud, but right behind it is many, many of our services are right there. Mm -hmm. I see. What's it like to, to work with all these big names that you mentioned before? You live in San Francisco, Silicon right. Valley. What yes. is it like to, I don't know, to go into a cafe, for example, and bump into uh, who, for example, somebody from Facebook, from uh, you, you Twitter, you bump into or... a lot of people. Yeah, you're like, oh, there's Zuckerberg, or um, you know, um, some of the founders of Apple, or some of the founders of NetApp, or it's pretty fascinating. Um, but it's not like here in Europe where there's paparazzis and people are pretty low key. And there are many times with sandals and shorts Very and casual, big beers, right? super, super casual. Uh, you never know who you're, you're sitting next to might be a billionaire or you see so you're always like being very nice and proper. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. You sit in cafes and, and you hear people doing business and, and dealing and the word innovation and you hear, you know, all the techie words around mm -hmm. there. How many women are in this uh, world you're living in and you're working uh, sure. in? Uh, of course, there are fewer women than men. Is, do you think this situation is changing, is uh, improving? What is the, the situation in the States, in the States, in San Francisco? So you have to look almost like um, imagine, and I'm going to speak about the Silicon Valley because that's the data that I have. So this is on the West Coast in California, sure. middle of the States. I'm not talking about LA or I'm not talking about Eureka in the North. San Francisco, So I'm Silicon talking Valley. about the Silicon Valley, yeah. Um, you have to almost imagine a pyramid where there is a fair amount of university females studying computer science or data science or going into engineering. Mm -hmm. But as, and let's say this, this is in red, so there's a f uh, same number of women, or in many cases, more women than guys. Okay. But now they get into the company, they're having a harder time getting those jobs. And I don't know, sometimes we think that the job descriptions feel very intimidating. You know, some of these companies, before you get in, they, they test you, you know, do you know how to test with C++ or do you know yep. how to test in all these mm -hmm. different coding languages? So that in itself is like, wow, you know, it's already very difficult. It's pretty harsh. It's, in, it's intimidating, okay. you know, and uh, uh, if you interview for Amazon, you know, you're going in front of a tribunal of 10 people and each person has a different role of, you know, they're, they're studying your character and if you would be a good team player. So the, getting into these companies is pretty difficult. And so when you look at this pyramid, it, it, it's the, it, let's say if the color red were the female, okay. there's fewer red, fewer, 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 and at the top, there's almost no red, right? And why is that? It's the, the teams that started these groups, the, the engineering groups, are mainly male. It's not that they're not welcoming yes. women and mm -hmm. that they're trying to get in women, but it's just a fact there's more guys in there. Mm -hmm. right. We are desperately trying to find more women, but we're having a hard time. So these ladies that are now in their last year of university, we go 
Facebook goes, Google goes, PayPal goes, eBay goes, Apple goes to try to get these women, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And so they're competing in um, offers, mm -hmm. so really great salary offers. And sometimes we get some in and Google gets yeah. a lot of them, right? <laughs> Okay. Maybe should, they should also be encouraged to, uh, to enroll in universities in, technological, uh, in the technological field? Well, that's up to the women. I mean, um, I've, I've, I've had daughters and I've raised daughters and some are interested and some are not, you know, and I've pushed for let's go and do those scientific yeah. projects, mm -hmm. right? Right. I know you are uh, involved uh, in a number of uh, NGOs for the empowerment of uh, women. That's right, yeah. In what fields, what activities do you do uh, there exactly? Well, so they're a little bit different. Uh, one of them, it's called Women in Technology. So that's in SiteNetApp, we're 1,300 women, and we create this community where we support each other. And in fact, we end up doing business with each other, right? Because maybe I need somebody from marketing or somebody from engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, how many how many people are you at NetApp in total? We are 11,000 employees. Wow. That's at, a lot. At NetApp, yeah. So let's say, you know, 1,300 are part of Women in te Technology. And we have some guys in there, which is open to everybody because there's a lot of guys that want to help out. Yeah. It's just that necessarily they don't know exactly how to help out, um, you know, and sometimes it's like, well, just slow down. You know, when you have an opening, try to find a resume that doesn't look like that, you mm -hmm. know. So that's one NGO. The other one is women in localization. So that we are about 6,000 women there. We're in 30 countries. I think we're in Romania. Oh, okay. uh, we're here in Catalonia. <laughs> so all the Catalan ladies, yes. please check it out if you're into linguistics. Um, another NGO that I started is called STEM Mentors. And it's for the Silicon Valley. It was an Obama initiative that they were looking for somebody in the Silicon Valley to get it going. And that NGO is to look for the poorest of the poorest little kids. Um, and there's a lot of poverty in the Silicon Valley that people don't realize that, right? Oh. Um, where there, these are kids that are growing up without parents or growing up okay. with grandparents sleeping in cars, sleeping in trailers. So we try to find these kids and once a year and we bring them, them in. Mm -hmm. And we introduce them to a dentist, we introduce them to a doctor, we introduce them to a fireman, so that they can start thinking, what does a doctor look like? Like some of these kids have never gone to the dentist, right? Is that serious? Is that serious? It's super serious. Okay, yeah. well, anyway, uh, we'll continue our chat talking about women who like uh, Anna have attained a high position in the business world and have paved the way for others. But before that, let's uh, take a quick break and watch a short language tip with our teacher, Mark Roderick. Hi, so I'm sure that lots of you have come up with imaginative ways of killing boredom in the last year. And one of the ways that you might have thought is playing board games. Anything from Monopoly to Catan to chess, etc. Now, of course, Playing your favorite board game in English is even more fun, but you might need some vocabulary to go along with it so that you don't look out of place, okay? The first expression you might use is, hey, let's place the board. And place the board obviously means to open the board and put the pieces on it. If it's a chessboard, of course, you put the white pieces on one side and the black pieces on the other side, okay? The next expression you might use is, of course, whose turn is it? Now, of course, if you're playing chess, you might not use this because it's a two-player game. But if it's a multiplayer game, such as Monopoly, where there are five or six players, then, of course, you might get lost as to whose turn it is next. All right? Then we have, of course, to roll the dice. Now, we use the word dice, whether it's one dice or two dice, it doesn't really matter, okay? So if it's your turn, you say, hey, I need to roll the dice. Some people roll the dice by giving it a little bit of extra luck. They might blow into it or something like that to make it, I don't know, looking for double sixes, double fives, etc. Okay, so rolling the dice can be a bit of fun as well. And when you do roll the dice, you do need to do something else. You need to move your counter. Now, going back to Monopoly, your counter, of course, is the little statuette that you have that you move around the board. I believe you have a little hat or an iron or indeed a little car. It's kind of funny. 
And the final thing we talk about is, of course, an hourglass, okay? An hourglass is this small little hourglass full of sand, okay? That generally dictates an amount of time that you have to do an activity. We use it in games such as Pictionary, where you have to draw something and the other person has to guess what you're drawing. You turn the hourglass and when the sand reaches the bottom and there's no more sand left, your time is up. So, that's it, and may the best player win. Face to face with myself in silence, music goes on in my head. In a few minutes, we'll be talking with and listening to the music of a great artist, Ayala. Stay tuned. In silence, the music goes on in my head. Face to face with myself in silence, I feel peace deep. Welcome back. We're talking to Anna Navarro Schlegel, Vice President of the Silicon Valley based company NetApp and an influential woman in the world of uh, technology. And now joining us today is our contributor, the book publisher Patricia Scalona. Hello, Patricia. Welcome Hi. back. Thank you. Hi. Well, Patricia, Anna, you know, she's a woman that has made it to the top. She's an example for other women, but I take you, I take it you have more examples like that, I, right? I do. Even though it is a truth universally acknowledged that it's harder for women to succeed in the professional world than it is for men. But what happens when you add um, the, um, the, you have the added problem of having an accent, you know, particularly in the meccas of business like the UK and the US. So there are many Catalan women who have actually succeeded in the professional world, around the world, but I have a few contemporary examples. Mm -hmm. and like, like women from Catalonia who made it to uh, the US or the UK, right? Exactly. Famous exactly. names. Yes, right. famous names actually. From different walks of life, right? Exactly, exactly mm -hmm. that. A bit towards the arts because you know me. But <laughs> yeah, of course. Let's start with arts. Um, so Laia Costa, you Laia know her? Laia Costa, of yeah, course. The actress. The She's actress. Um, currently living in Miami, actually. Mm, right. Um, she was born in Barcelona. Um, and she's 36 years old now. And she's become one of the most ubiquitous um, indie scene film actresses. Yeah, she did you know, like a bunch of films. Yeah. A she, lot of indie films. Exactly. She started with um, leading roles as a waitress turned bank robber in Victoria in a film called Victoria from 2015. A young woman in love with Nicholas Holt, whom you may remember because he was a little boy in About a Boy with Hugh Grant. Yeah, uh, and then right. he became an X-Man mm -hmm. as well. Um, she's also been a wannabe musician in a comedy called Duck Butter and so many other also, ending up with, um, with uh, an Amazon series called Soulmates. Mm -hmm. and, and now, as I said, uh, she currently lives in Miami. Mm -hmm. um, Good for her. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, I have a question though, you feel for you, do um, okay. you think that achieving success in the US means be more successful actually than if you achieve it at home or in any other country in the world? I, I've never thought about that. I don't know, I'm just, I, I, I don't know. I'm not used to this, you know, getting awards and stuff. I just get up every day like anybody else and go and I do my work. So at home, my mom, you know, they, they yell at me. They, <laughs> they, I still make dinner every night. So I, I, I don't think about it. I, I think this coming here and everybody wants to talk to me, it surprised me a little bit mm -hmm. because there's so many incredible women, right? Like, why am I not interviewing you here? <laughs> oh, and, come on. Well, <laughs> let's, not, let's not exaggerate. <laughs> no, but it's true. I, I think there's, there's an incredible amount of uh, women. I'm part of the Diplotech, Diplocat, here for the last few years, and there's um, many role models of women that are CEOs and have started, you know, in robotics or or gamers and do other stuff. But Anna, let me ask you, you're surely a model for other women, but did you have or um, uh, did you have or have either here in Catalonia or in the US, um, a woman like a, who was, who is a model for you? Like uh, an example when you started? Well, I used to watch Marisa Meyer a lot, especially when she was, she got out of Google and went on to Yahoo. She became the CEO of Yahoo. I watched her a little bit. 
Yeah, I mean, I love Michelle Obama, you know, how strong she is. But I also look at you, Marce at Marcella, and I look at Joanna Barbani, and I look at Angela Merkel, and I look at women in Japan and women in India. I look at everybody. Um, it doesn't need to be from one country to the, to the other. I just like to see, you know, how are you sitting? How are you speaking? How are you portraying yourself? That's how I learn. I, I don't have posters of these women, but I do look at them, you know, and I think like, oh my God, that was an incredible speech, or that's somebody that's sitting straight up, or... Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't matter, you know, whether they make it in the US, that's... Uh, no. I think exactly no, no, the right no, story no. women everywhere. Yeah, I mean, exactly. look at the... To, uh, to look out for them and, and, and learn tiny things that make, yeah. make you what look you are, right? Look at the president of New Zealand right now, Ooh. right? So Yeah, she's incredible. She's yeah. unbelievable and she has kids and she speaks very normally and yeah. very calmly. Down to earth, yeah. They're very super down to I'm earth. I'm a fan as well. So yes, I'm a fan. we all are. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Talking about right. the Commonwealth, we are going to the UK now with uh, Miriam Escoffet. I don't oh, know yeah. if you've heard of her. She's a painter, an artist. Painter, uh, yeah. She was born also. in 1967, and she, then she moved to the UK when she was 19 years old, and she studied at St. Martin's Schools of Arts, yeah. which is like the most prestigious um, art school in the world. And she is, she became widely known here in Catalonia uh, because of her portrait of the Queen, exactly. which is uh, marvelous. It's, um, I think it's a very sincere and honest portrait, um, as we can see now, as the queen uh, the, of the queen as an old woman, and she's got this teacup by her side, you know. And when she was presenting it to the queen, the queen noticed that it was empty. You know, it's like she, say, she actually said, "Medium, but the, the, the cup of tea is empty," <laughs> <laughs> which I saw when I saw the, pin, the painting as a um, as a metaphor for her. You know, you know, she's coming to the end of her. Life. It's an interesting queen. detail. So I think I think it's a metaphor. If you told them you're Catalan, right? Would they know uh, how to put it on the map? Would they know Sometimes. anything about Catalonia? Are Catalans known in San Francisco? What do they know about Catalans? And if also if there are many Catalans working there with you in the Silicon Valley, it depends on where you are in the states. They're gonna say Cata what? You know, like <laughs> they, they they they're not gonna know. I think right. If you're in New York or if you're in California, like people go like, oh, okay, is it right next to the Basque country? Or they, they start to ubicate, you know? And I mm -hmm. I always say, I am from the Pyrenees. They go like, what is that? You know, they, they it's relate. It's like the Alps, the Catalan Alps, right? <laughs> I, I, they relate it because a lot of people there have this uh, Pyrenean dog. There's the, the mm -hmm. a dog brand that's a, a, a Los Pirenaico. Yeah, right. and they, so it's quite uh, popular in yeah. San Francisco? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then oh, I, I say, yeah, yeah, I'm from there, I'm from there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then when you say Barcelona, then they get it, right? Oh, Spain. Straight away. Spain, Spain. I said, no, not Spain, Catalonia. Mm -hmm. Oh, what is that? You know, and I said, well, it's between France and, and right after the Pyrenees. <laughs> okay, right. Even, even, but even when if you say Spain, you know, to try to situate it, then, then a little bit, they would go like, where? Puerto Rico? Cuba? Uh, it's like, no, that's Latin America. That's near Portugal. Well, yeah. One of my first phone calls when I got to the States, you know, I said, I need to call the Spanish consulate and they passed me to the, like this, the, the, yeah, some, uh, <laughs> some <laughs> Central American country. Yeah, <laughs> what about? It, it, but I, I, I don't want to exaggerate though. Mm -hmm. There's very well educated people that actually know what's actually happening here. Yes. So they're either very well educated and they will poke me, you know, oh, you're Spanish or oh, you're French or oh, you're, you know, so they, they know very well. So do you know a lot of Catalan, uh, Catalans who work in the Silicon Valley? Many, many, yeah? many. Yeah, many. Yeah, we're many me means what? Many, we are counted. We are, I think, between 13 and 1400 wow, Catalans. Wow, that's a lot. Wow. In the Bay Area. Do you know each other? Do you socialize? Well, I know hundreds of them and some come and go, right? Okay. Also, they come to stay at Stanford. They mm -hmm. come to do things at Berkeley or the Haas Institute. Amazing. And, yeah, and we have a, a Telegram group or WhatsApp groups and everybody joins and everybody welcomes Do everybody. you ever meet to celebrate any Catalan traditions? All like the time. Like consultadas and stuff oh like that. Oh my God, we've done, 
I really? <laughs> I don't can know that I can calzots? tell you all can the you things that I've done. Can you find calzots in San Francisco? Huh? Can you find calzots in San Francisco? Well, they, there's, <laughs> they, they try. I, I think there's yeah, like really? some farmer that is trying to grow them. You know, like there was one guy that was trying to replicate fuet. Okay. Um, and pam you know, tomata, I, I guess it's just yes, 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 easier yeah. to make. Yeah, and and there's several Catalan restaurants there with Catalan chefs, right? That okay. they have come. That's there's brilliant. El Teleferic, El B44, y a la Catalana. So yeah, all the, those restaurants are there, and we meet there, and we watch soccer and. It's amazing. San Jordi, have you managed to bring San Jordi over to San Jordi, um, <laughs> Calçotades, van portar els castellers, we brought, brought in the castellers, and in fact, we opened our homes so that they didn't need to pay for a hotel. I drove them, I drove many suitcases <laughs> in excellent. my car, you know, so mm -hmm. I drove them around. Right. Yeah. Would you recommend uh, uh, people from here, young Catalans who want to, to succeed, to have a successful career, would you recommend them to, to go to the States or to, to China or to another country in order to succeed, succeed, achieve a successful career? Or would you recommend them to, to stay here? It depends on what kind of success they want. I mean, it's like, such a big question. I mean, if they want to end like up international, at a working Fortune in international 500 companies. company, hmm. they may have to, you know. But NetApp is here. NetApp is in Barcelona. Really? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We opened an office about a year ago here. Ah, we used to have a good. small office. Um, and, you know, I had a little bit to do that to make sure that the office was opened here. Oh, it's great. Um, I didn't know that. So, so Google is here. Right? Facebook mm -hmm. is here, Microsoft is here, Amazon is here. I, I always say maybe travel a little bit, stay six months, but do come back. We need people to come back. Um, we need to keep the talent also here, we right? We have to, we have to. I know right now that the success that I have is because I've traveled so much. I've, I've lived in Africa, I've lived in London, I've lived in Berlin, I've spent many years in the States. but. Boy, would I wish that all my kids were here right now. But they can't. They're all in American universities, and I'm not going to be the mom that leaves them all there and I move here, right? So it sure. becomes very difficult. At the beginning, when you're in your 20s, you feel very powerful, right? Like, eh, I'm going to move to the States for a few years. I'm going to conquer the world. But then you marry, <laughs> and you have kids, and then you have a startup, and then things are happening, and, and you stay, and your kids start going to kindergarten. And then you're like, where are my family dinners with my, my peeps? You know, you, you need your mom all the time. Although my parents have come to the States so many times, right? And my brothers and cousins and such, yeah. but- But still, you miss them. All the time. So I would tell people, please stay, you know, go for a year, but do come back. Do come back. Yeah. Okay, well, all this is very interesting, but I'm afraid we are uh, reaching the end of the interview. But before we end the conversation, we uh, need to ask you a surprise question. We call it the question chain, which is a question from our previous guest, in this case, the popular weatherman, uh, Tomas Molina. Oh. <laughs> Let's uh, check him out. Well, I'm a fan of Tomas. Hello, my name is Tomas Molina. I'm the weatherman at Television of Catalonia. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, what do you think about the weather people? What do you think about the weather forecasters? Do you think we are sometimes wrong, always wrong, never wrong? I, I have this, this feeling that maybe you think that we are not wrong always. <laughs> oh my God! Just cracking up. I mean, I, even before I left the, for the states, I used to follow Tomas. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is quite a surprise. It really surprised me. <laughs> I, oh Tomas, I think sometimes you guys are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, Sorry. And um, and I think sometimes they're very right. And and it's fascinating because we've learned with Tomas, you know, with people like Tomas, like really all about a climate change and and how to get ready for the weekend. So that was a very nice surprise. Thank you, Tomas. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's say they are mostly reliable, right? Okay, mostly reliable, <laughs> sometimes a little Tomas, off. okay, yeah. don't get mad at us. We no. love you. 
Okay, and uh, well, Anna, just before we go, we know that you've been living in the States since uh, the 90s, early uh, 90s. So uh, after all this time in the US, are you planning to stay there like uh, forever or for a long time still? Or do you plan to come back to Catalonia one day? I, I don't have that figured out. I, I really don't. It's difficult. Uh, it's, yeah, I... I'm trying to spend more and more time here. Every time I come, I stay an extra week, and I used to come once a year and then twice a year, and now it's three times a year, and now they've already invited me to come back in September. I already said yes, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm telling people, please don't be of two countries. It's very expensive, it, unless you're like super <laughs> close, these countries, right? It's hard to be on, on these long trip airplanes. I dream that California and Catalonia are neighbors, and this is a, becomes like California or something. <laughs> and uh, that would be great. I maybe if I can, you know, if my health and everything is the dream come true. I spend many months there and many months here. That would be ideal, I guess. Mm -hmm. Ideally, okay. Yeah. Well, Anna, thank you so much oh for coming. Oh my God, thank it's you. Such a great pleasure. Uh, an honor to have you here today to talk about it's technology, about women empowerment and so many other things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. <laughs> and thank you so much, Patricia. My pleasure. Time. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Patricia. This is uh, Fighting and Learning, chosen as 2020's best Catalan song by the audience of the ICAT uh, radio station, Ayala. Chose this song as the first single from her second album, a mature musical proposal called 2021, an Earth Oddity. And today we're going to find out about her latest work. Uh, Hara Ayala, welcome to the Weekly Mag. Welcome. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Let's talk about this uh, album, your new album. You wanted to experiment a little bit, uh, you wanted to change styles, but without uh, renouncing to electronic and uh, urban uh, music. Tell us about the result. Well, I've, I've always liked black music. It's my main style, I think. And everything that goes from soul to blues and to hip hop and electronic music, and all these newest sounds of urban rhythm. And I think, I think that's what you can hear in this album. Mm -hmm. What do you think has changed from your previous album to the second? Well, uh, I've changed as a person, as a musician, I've grown and as a composer too. And well, everything that happens in life finally uh, makes you grow, and that is reflected to in, my songs, in your music, I think, of yes. course. Mm -hmm. In this work, you have combined, like you said, different genres, and we, um, in the press release, uh, you call them, for example, I will quote um, a few of them, Mediterranean blues, the trap that is heard on uh, Jupiter, and the funk that makes uh, the moon uh, spin uh, round. So when we hear about all these astronomical references, what, what do they mean? What do, you, what do we need to imagine? Well, the sky is a subject that has always interested me a lot as a young child. I always used to look up to the stars and moon and wonder and imagine things and question things about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that has always inspired me, but not just the sky in its own has inspired me. It also has inspired so many different type of artists around the world, and which art has then inspired myself. Do you miss covers? Because you started uh, performing covers, uh, but then you started to create your own music. Do you miss uh, that part of your life, of your career? Well, I don't really miss it because I still do covers at home. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, but mm, there was there was something about making covers that make me realize that I really wanted to do my own music because I've always I've always wrote since I was a little girl I find something so freeing in writing and taking out my emotions and also in singing and playing guitar or piano and so 
there, there was a time that covers weren't enough and okay. I needed to, to put music to my words. So it was like a natural process yes. in, your, totally. in your career. Well, um, you were not nominated as an emerging artist at the Association de Representantes de Catalunya Music Awards last year and this song, Fighting and Learning, has been chosen as the best Catalan song by the listeners of the ICAT radio station. What is the situation of uh, urban music in Catalonia, would you say? Um, it's, it's complicated because I don't know if I'm really into this urban music scene because I know I play with a lot of... of okay, I mean, it's not necessarily just urban? Yes, I, I think I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not only urban music mm -hmm. since I, I play a lot of different styles and I, I think I'm sort of at the border of a lot of different styles mm -hmm. of music. So urban music, electronic, what you said before, soul, soul right? blues and, and blues. Okay. Black music, not in general. In general. Okay, what about the, the lockdown and all this pandemic uh, situation? How has it uh, affected you and, and your career? Many artists said that they had more time and more peace of mind, more time to create. Was, was the lockdown uh, productive for you in the sense? Yes, I, since, since we had a lot of concerts that we couldn't make, I tried to take all this time that I wasn't really supposed to have and take advantage, advantage of it. And besides of that, I also, well, with the band, we also made some videos playing from home. Yeah. And trying to stay cre creative, creative and still doing things and not stop. Mm -hmm. And actually you are doing things, uh, uh, you reinvented uh, yourself, you're doing new things, but also you uh, have started to go uh, back uh, on stage, right? Actually yes. today you have uh, one concert. Today we're playing at 8, I think, in Lanao, in Poblano, mm -hmm. and okay, we great. are looking forward <laughs> to it. Yeah, well I bet you do. Okay, and today what are you going to play for us? I've come with Paul Sistak, my guitar, and we're going to play an acoustic version of Face to Face Silence. Mm -hmm. Excellent. It's about what? It's about, well, I, I wrote this song uh, during the lockdown, so it's about looking inside and, and staying silent for, for recognizing things that you usually, usually don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, looking forward to listening to the song. And by the way, I love your nails. Thanks. And what I find amazing is they, uh, you, you told me that they are real. Yes, they, they are my real nails. Not like Rosalia's. No, right? <laughs> Okay, well, uh, Ayala, thank you so much for coming today uh, to the weekly MAG. Good luck with uh, all your projects. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. And after the music playtime, stay tuned for Guess What? The Funny TV Quiz with Sergi Cervera. on in my head face to face with myself in silence feel peace deep in my heart face to face with myself in silence the music goes on in my head face to face with myself in silence feel peace deep in my heart cause i know what i want and how i want it i don't need no one to do it for me i already know the price and i will pay it i don't mean i think i just wanna be free Face to face with myself in silence But I can't stop the music in my head You know I just wanna sing all day And dance all day and play all day Face to face with a 20 year old me I don't know her now but she's quite funny 
I wish I could be with her one night To think and talk about her crazy life To heal the pain she's carrying inside To laugh about some things I've done To love myself and not judge no more To be in peace in silence and alone Stay face to face with myself in silence the Music goes on in my head Face to face with myself in silence Feel a place deep in my heart Face to face with myself in silence The music goes on in my head Face to face with myself in silence I feel peace deep Face to face with myself in silence. The music goes on in my head. Face to face with myself in silence. Feel peace deep in my heart. Face to face with myself in silence. The music goes on in my head. Face to face with myself in silence. Feel peace deep. Silence when I'm lost and I'm trying to find her. Silence when I'm alone, it's late at night and I can't sleep. <laughs> and after that great song from Ayala, it's time to play with Sergio Severa. Yes! Hi everyone and welcome to Guess What? The TV quiz where the right answers are as ridiculous as the questions. <laughs> and let's begin by saying welcome back to today's guest, uh, the contributor to this show, Danny Gutierrez. Welcome back, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here I am trying to fight this uh, contestants. Yeah, do <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, particularly in that side of the, of the screen. You mean the winning side? <laughs> Well, we'll see about that. Uh, let's Thank see, you. Danny is a one-man band. Not only is he the accomplished cameraman and editor of our reports, he's also a documentary filmmaker and has traveled around the world. So, uh, Danny, I know you have uh, some projects in the, in the pipeline. Uh, right now, can you tell uh, us something about any of them? Uh, yeah, we had, uh, beside me in, the, uh, in this program, uh, we are working on a, on a project, we create a, a pilot program. It's related to, to antiques with a group of, of friends. I have an antique wow. dealer mm -hmm. uh, who is uh, traveling all around Catalonia. So we try to, to find uh, objects and we try to find, you know, this kind of uh, curious and strange people, collectors and as well small villages. So we do some kind of uh, a road trip and, and finding, uh, finding uh, you know, uh, antiques all around uh, the place. So yeah, to, to explain a little bit as well, the, the history of Catalonia or some some tips of that history, wheat as well, and it's, well, it's an interesting story. We are working on that. We'll see what's going on. I've that. seen it, and I have to say that I vouch for this show. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, we had. <laughs> pretty amazing, indeed. Yeah. All right, well, this time, Danny will be playing against Wendy Kessler, our new <laughs> player, as well as our Harry and charismatic Dr. Matthew Murtha, hello, my friends. Hello, hello. I am ready to attack. My mind is sharp as, is as, sharp as a rock. You, uh, uh, oh, that's probably what? not. The other, <laughs> the other way around. I'm ready to rock. My mind is sharp as a pack. We just had a discussion about that just before. Don't do that. <sighs> You're scared, right? Okay. All right, guys. We'll kick off with the round called what are they talking about? <laughs> Makes sense, right? Uh, one point for every right answer. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, guys, uh, you know how it works. You'll see some edited videos of people describing something, and all you have to do is uh, guess what they are describing and write it on your blackboards, please. So, let's watch the first video and try to guess what these guys are talking about. You guys ready? Ready. Sure. Let's yeah. go. Uh, the gravity is so hard. Very massive star combination of particles in the space. It's basically very, very, very dark. Okay, do you get it? Particles in the space, very, very dark. What are they talking about? Show your answers. Okay. Now. 
Oh, not done. See? Black hole. And Dark the correct matter. answer is black hole indeed. So Matthew and Wendy are correct. What would you say about uh, Danny's say answer? That, that was that was quite fair. Yeah, but, but not it's wrong. correct. <laughs> Life is not fair. But so, it's so close. It's so close. It's so close. Right? But not close enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, next time, Bunny. I'm sure next you'll time. Uh, get we it. We support right. you. We, we, we have faith in you, Dad. Okay, I'll try next time. Okay, guys, it's time to move forward. Let's take a look on the next video. Check it out. It's a liquidish material that's not completely liquid and it's really easy to separate one piece from the other. Some goo that's sticky. It's like a non-liquid, liquid, sticky goo. Like it's not solid, it's not liquid either. And sticky. There you go. There you go. What those faces mean? Time to show some answers. Are you guys ready? Ready, Three, steady. Three, two, one, show them to me. And sanitizer. Sir? <laughs> Olive. 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 Plus, plus bread. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, time for tomato, but okay. <laughs> Great jelly. Yeah. I think he's hungry. Did somebody give him breakfast? <laughs> I actually would have some lunch with both of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, and massage. the right answer, ah. I'm sorry to say, is slime. Uh, e e so, not even close. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. Hey, what flavor of slime? Was it grape slime? <laughs> it depends on okay, what you eat. Nice try, Matthew. Nice all right, try. All right, all right. Can you nice use slime time. for massage? I don't know. Uh, have oh, you ever well, tried? Uh, well, yeah, probably. Okay. Let's leave it here. Okay. I think it's the right moment just to move forward to the third video. Animal that lives primarily on bamboo forests uh, that uses to eat uh, eucalyptus. All right. I mean, sometimes, in case you were wondering, the people we ask for some answers, they don't know everything, as you, as you can see, but their faces they <laughs> okay. really talk. They can so, talk. So, let's see. What do you think? Show the answers. A Point. panda, a panda. A panda. That has, uh, uh, well done, well done. And a panda. Hey, that's a koala. Yes, right. We, if but actually, a koala, is this a koala or a panda? A koala. It's, a it's a koala. It's a koala. Okay, yeah. because the correct answer is a, a koala. koala. Oh, oh, it's, it's, a it's a panda. It's a, panda. <laughs> it's a koala named Panda. You didn't get it, right, Wendy? <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's he it. has a, a personality disorder and he, he likes him to yeah, he identify not really right. identifies as a panda. But it's not koala. written okay. anywhere that the quizmaster right. has to be fair or not biased. <laughs> Or okay, smart. so the situation right. is one uh, point one for Wendy. One point for Wendy. None. And that's it. And none for you. Yes, yeah, more as you said. Yeah, the proof is that you were the quiz master once when we oh, when I... we celebrate 100, right? So by the way, did you have any fluffy animals when you were little, or or, or even now, as an adult, or even Matthew? now at present? <laughs> Does a sister count as a fluffy animal? I don't know. Uh, kind of treating her with it, it, it. It depends. Is she real? Uh, yeah, she's real. Is she imaginary? No, no, she goes to the psycho, I think, is because of that. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. okay, let's hope she's not watching the no, show okay. right now. <laughs> she's fine. Okay. She's just an actress. Definitely. <laughs> just an actress. Just an actress. I have to just deal with that. Actress. How about you? Right. Any confession you want to share with us? Uh, no, the... Not that you want to share it. They say I'm not allowed to pet okay. the, the okay. bunnies anymore. Okay. I killed my fair share of hamsters. Damn, wow. that's a hell of a confession. Mm. That, that wasn't expected. No. Okay. That's tough. Okay. okay. Which means it's the right, right moment to move forward. The next video. <laughs> it's a two-piece instrument that you usually use to create a house. You can create a koala. A tool made of generally plastic or metal. Whoa. A tool what? made by plastic or metal, two piece. To maybe make a house, is that what they said? She said so, she said so. But. Is she right? <laughs> it's her opinion. I would say it's just a personal opinion, or I don't it know. depends on the house, uh, right? Cut some paper. Cut some yeah. Cardboard paper. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. That kind oh, of house. So, it's time to... To see your answers. No, I have the no idea. answers. Don't look, Danny, just answer. Answer, answer now. Okay, here. Scissors <laughs> and scissors. And that means that... 
Caesar is the correct answer. Caesar is the correct answer, but I liked your. I mean, like it was very yeah, creative. Cut <laughs> the air, makes sense. It was symbolic, yeah. Yes. That's right. It, All right. It totally makes sense. Again, <laughs> it's a fair answer, but you lost. <laughs> zero point zero four, yeah. But there is one more video. Yeah, so... well, you still have a chance. So let's move forward to the last and least video. He has red hair. He's making people super happy. It's a singer. Famous for uh, his tracks. He has kids and he's also from Britain. A singer, a red hair singer. Uh, Very from famous. Britain. Uh, from Britain. Oh, what is his name? <laughs> <laughs> this famous the singer. The little gremlin one, yeah. The, the right. very famous singer, the, the, the very touch British. of me and... Attached to you? You know... No, you, no, no. The, you have a past song. This person? song is that. Ah, the song. You know, it's no. not Harry, it's the other one. The one... Okay, I think cheat, you should, you should start oh. to decide on your answer. Exactly, start writing on your blackboard. A British, red-haired, very famous singer. He, um... Uh, okay. Three, two, one, show the answer! This is not my answer. It's Harry, Elton John and Carpool's Karaoke Guy. <laughs> I want to change my answer. And Did Elton you? John is the answer, of Elton course! Elton John is the answer! Yeah. I knew yeah. this was exactly. the answer the entire time. Well I'll let done. you change your answer. I did not oh. think it was Ed Sheerhand. I didn't know the Prince Harry... So um, he doesn't sing, but he's got red hair and he's English. So yeah, I thought that, I got like three, you go. three, you got three, three out of two. Out of three, uh, okay. Yeah, two and out of three. Gay. So what's your favorite I mean, Elton know, John we, song? We Do you know any uh, songs by Elton John? <laughs> any uh, song of his uh, in your Rocket favorites? Man. Mm. Rocket Man, yes, exactly. See, his biopic. Have you seen it? Yeah, I have. Actually, I think it was a, a fantastic film. Yeah. Indeed. We'll let him yeah, know. Yeah, I agree. That you support and you enjoy it. <laughs> okay. Okay. We've got a draw. Wendy and Matthew are competing for the first position with three points each. Mm -hmm. And Danny so, yeah. has a lot to win because he's got nothing. You've got air. nothing to lose. <laughs> air. Yeah. You have nothing everything. to lose. I have the air win. there. You know, I knew the answer was for me. Yeah, that's what I have. The victory air, is coming to you, my okay. friend. I can feel it. <laughs> right. Okay, and after this warm-up, you'd better prepare yourself before playing the Speed Challenge! There you go! Of course, and talking of playing, before we continue, here comes Marbor Rick with his second language tip about games. And now he's going to teach us some basic vocabulary about playing cards. Let's check it out. Hi, and welcome back. And to continue our tips on talking about games, this time not board games, but card games. And of course, any card game. It could be the typical Spanish card game, it could be Uno, but in this case, we're going to talk about these cards, okay? Which, of course, you play poker, blackjack, 25, etc. And the first expression that you might need, of course, is a deck of cards. A deck of cards is, of course, this. In a deck of cards, there are 52, in fact little bit of useless information for you, okay? Now, in order that they're not in the same order, for example, that you don't have the Ace of Hearts, the Ace of Diamonds, the Ace of Spades, and the Ace of Clubs in the same order, what do you need to do with the cards? You need to shuffle them. Now, I'm no expert at this. People seem to think I am, but I'm not. If you want to shuffle, you just do this. Shuffle the cards, change the order, so that when you play the game, everybody is dealt a fair hand, okay? Once, of course, you have finished shuffling the cards, what do you need to do? Well, you need to deal out the cards. And of course, if you go to Las Vegas or any of these casinos, you have a specific job, which is the dealer. Doesn't mean he deals drugs, be careful. It's the guy who deals the cards. And to deal cards, they do it super fast, okay? I'm going to give you an example. Dealing cards to five people. Bam, one, two, three, four, five. Do you get the idea? Good. And the last one, of course, we had is a hand of cards. If you're playing poker, what you really need to focus on is your hand of cards, what cards you have been dealt. Have you been dealt good cards or bad cards? Is it worth betting more money or not betting more money? Well, that's up to you. We can also use it as a metaphorical saying that say that in life you have been dealt a good hand of cards means you're kind of lucky. So I hope that each and every one of you has been dealt a good hand of cards. All right, and now I hope you have a good hand of cards. In this case, cards 
with animals. You're gonna love okay, it. Okay, in today's uh, true or false speed challenge, we have listed some of the strangest creatures on Earth. And unfortunately, some creatures that come from uh, Sergi Cervera's wild imagination have uh, also found their way onto this list. Yeah, me included. <laughs> <laughs> As a wild animal. <laughs> So right. We will read them out and in less than three seconds you have to decide if they are true or false using your signs. Two points for every right okay. answer, okay? So the fork fish is a fish which has a fork-shaped nose and eats jellyfish. Is that true or false? True. False and true. Which and uh, means... Danny is correct, it's mm. false. Welcome to the podium! Well done! Thank One you. goes to Danny. Zero was stronger. Exactly. exactly. Right. Okay, next, uh, the blue dragon. A blue dragon shaped slug that floats on the sea. Is it true or is it false? True, true, and a true. And it's true! Well done, guys! Take a look of this beautiful body. Wow. Nice. <laughs> there you go. All right, next. The glass uh, frog, it's a frog with a transparent skin through which you can see its uh, internal organs. Is that true or false? True, true and true. And everybody is correct. Yay! Excellent, well done. Take Ooh. a look. Gross. It's a beautiful creature, beautiful. right? beautiful. <laughs> okay, next. The microphenia microstoma. A, <laughs> incorrect, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> a fish with a transparent head. Is it true or is it false? Is it true, mm -hmm. false mm -hmm. and false? Which means, when they got the points, true, here it is. Okay. I can't see it. No, it's transparent. <laughs> Good one. Well, you can see his head. Okay, uh, the Chiroptera vitreus, that's a uh, translucent bat through whose uh, abdomen you can see its latest meal. <laughs> true or false? Oh, I want it true, that one. False, true <laughs> and false, which and means... And it's false, Matthew and Wendy it's got false. one point false. each. But would that be cool, right? Yeah. Okay. What I want in reality, yeah, yeah they go exactly. really wishful separate. Thing. Let's call it wishful thinking. All right, let's move forward. Here we go. The red-lipped batfish, an ugly fish that lives on the bottom of the ocean, but has sensual red lips. Is it true or is it false? I want you it true. see it, right? I want it true, 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 and... It's not ugly. It is beautiful. Yeah, that's true. I thought that was really oh, beautiful. unfair. We will check that out, so check it out. Look at It's him. true. Oh. Point goes to Wendy and to Danny, and you didn't get the points. Looks like my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> we will ask right. her. We will okay. ask her what she thinks mm -hmm. about you, Zoe. So, a uh, Japanese spider crab, a big marine crab, whose leg span can reach way over three meters. True, true or true. false? True. Three meters is a lot. Let's but... have a look. Let's have a look. Wow. It is and it's true. true. It well is done. true. So everybody got one point, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 I'm trying Three to imagine meters. finding these at my apartment when I got <laughs> home after work and yeah, such a pet, right? It would right? be so great, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here we go. The Viking rabbit, a rabbit with two small horns. Is this true or false? False. Let's go. False and false, which means you all got the points. Well done. It's false. I just made it up. <laughs> all right. The panda ant. It looks like a normal ant, but it's white and black. True or false? The false. The koala. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I learned the lesson. Okay, let's have a look. Because it's it is true. true. Well done, Wendy and Matthew got the points. Okay. Never gonna come back. Getting there, getting there. So like we said, Sergi's imagination is uh, very uh, wild, but in this case, right? Sometimes uh, life beats. Um, yeah, matches beats my criteria. Fiction. Beats fiction, right? Or Sergi's <laughs> imagination. Exactly, matches my imagination <laughs> sometimes. Okay, last but not least, the satanic leaf tailed gecko is a small reptile from Madagascar which passes itself off as a dry leaf. Is it true or false? 
true, true, and true. Take a look because it's true. Well done. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <coughs> Everybody well has a uh, right, a correct answer. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't see any gecko. <laughs> and I just say it in there. Yeah, right? Right, so if you had to choose one of these uh, true animals, real uh, animals, as uh, your pet, which one would you choose spider, and why? Spider, spider, spider. Mm -mm. Giant spider. <laughs> <laughs> Tough question. Who's a crab? But a spider. It's not just a crab, but a spider. It's not yeah. just a spider, but a crab. He's your pet. I bet that thing's not even two meters. He just tells everybody it's three. It's three meters, right? He's compensating. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you know how they okay. are. Okay. <laughs> Probably the Madagascar one, so I have the opportunity to go there and, you know, give Maybe. it back to the nature. So Maybe I have it's the, just the person the who's small. Excellent. <laughs> Maybe this is a normal size <laughs> spider. It's a, it's a tiny guy. <laughs> okay. So right. Wendy got the lead with 21 points. Matthew is going right after with 17 points. And Danny can still win because he's having 14 points. Well done. Better than zero, yeah. Better I'm really zero, happy with better. that, so that's fine. Hands I thought down. it would stay better with that. Zero. Zero. Excellent. Yeah. I'll grant you that. Right, so let's start with uh, a famous game about uh, money, Monopoly. And talking of games of money, how many points do you want to bet? All right. Now, I'm sure you have seen the Monopoly men in the Monopoly box, of course, or in an adverts. But how many points Points do they want to bet? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, exactly. Before oh, the question. Oh, before the question. Before the oh. question. How many points do you want Monopoly to bet? God. <laughs> okay, I want to already put it out there. I have never won a game of Monopoly. Ah, uh, blah, blah, so blah. I get it off my chest. Blah, blah. That's just right. blah, blah, okay. blah. Okay. Just bet. No problem. So with caution, I will say two. Two, two points. points, okay. Yeah, that's a winner attitude. <laughs> oh, really? What if I let one? One. <laughs> two, two. I stand right. by two. Two, okay. Two. Okay, when this bravery. Yeah. One and a half is possible? Or it no, has to it be? is no. not. Mm. I just two decided and a half now. So? Three. Three. Three so points for Danny. Risky. Okay. <laughs> if he's going to do three, I'll do four. Four. And so four we got two, three, and Matthew. four. So here comes the question. The question is, does the man wear A, glasses, B, monocle, C, the guy doesn't wear glasses and doesn't wear either monocle? One, two, three, show the answers. B, B, and B. And it's not correct. What? It is C. It is damn C. No glasses, no Monaco. Really? That's, that's so if you yeah, answered yeah. glasses, you have got a big imagination. But if you answered Monaco, uh, if you answered Monaco, you have been a victim of the Mandela effect. That is, you have let popular culture mess up with your memory. The answer is, of course, indeed, C. He wears a top hat and has a stick, but not Monaco. Mm. Okay, second <laughs> question. Right? Yeah. Let's talk about the Bible. <laughs> Thank God. Okay? Specifically, the Adam and Eve story. But before uh, hearing the question, how many points do you want to bet? How many points do you want to bet? Now that you lost two, you lost three, and you lost four points. Let's just friendly reminder what are you of doing? Oh, you're doing <laughs> how the score is going on. Okay. You don't Zero? want ten. Oh, get ten. a point. Right. No, oh, you're no betting point. 10 points. So you, yeah. you, you no have points a religious background, as, as, as we can I, see. You play you definitely uh, have a religious background. Strategy. Yes. So, so Wendy lost two points on the last uh, question. Danny lost three points Zero. from uh. the general score that he already had. And Dr. Matthew Murtha lost four points out of the 17 he mm -hmm. got. Okay, and now so. Wendy bets uh, six. Six. So Danny? Ten. ten. Let's go. Ten. And Matthew? Let's go. I'll go with four again. And you go with four. Four again. So, okay. Exactly. Four again for Matthew. Okay. So the question is. He goes the question. What fruit does the Bible say that if gave to Adam A, an apple, B, a watermelon, watermelon sugar, hi, <laughs> C, it actually doesn't say. What is the right answer for how many points did you say? Six. For six, ten, ten. and four points, what the right answer is. 
I, this is terrible after that last Two. question. It's a trick. As I said, one. Fun Show the answer. C, C, and C, which means Wendy got six points, Danny got ten points, and Dr. Matthew Morsa got four points. Well Everybody uh, is correct. <laughs> the right. answer was C, absolutely. The Bible doesn't say what kind of fruit it is, only that is a forbidden fruit. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, friendly reminder, the score is looking just like this. Wendy is ahead with 25 points. Well done. Ooh. Danny is going second with 21. <clears throat> Ooh. And Dr. Matthew Morsa is logically losing again. You deserve that. Okay. Don't, don't make faces on me. Don't roll your eyes on me. 17 points. For now. I'm losing for now. I've, you're losing for now. We'll for see now, exactly. That. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, and let's get ready for the third and last question. So in a few days, we'll be celebrating the 23rd of April, which is also the 405th anniversary of William Shakespeare's death. So uh, what we have for you today is a question about Romeo and Juliet. So it's time to bet. It's time to bet. For 25, 21, and 17 points, how many points do you want to bet? How many points do you want to bet? Write it down for me and show the blackboards oh. in three, two, one. Here we go. Oh, 10, 21, it, and 17. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, the game is getting really exciting. Really, really up. exciting. Wendy's yeah. betting 10 points, Danny's <laughs> betting it all. And Dr. Matthew Murtha is betting it all. So the question goes like this. Feel the tension here, Pierre, <laughs> as Danny said in the early part of the game. Which of these objects William Shakespeare did not put in his most famous play about love? A, a balcony. B, a lather. C, poison. One of these is right, the other two are wrong. For 10, 21, and 17 points, show the blackboards now. B, leather, B, and B, leather. Which means that but. Wendy lost 10 points and Danny and Dr. Matthew Morsa lost it, it all. You lost it all. <laughs> so unfortunately, never, uh, none of the three uh, contestants got the right answer. Absolutely. Because it the correct was answer was... A balcony, guys. Mm -hmm. A balcony. Actually, not only is the word balcony missing in the entire play, it is improbable that Shakespeare knew the word or um, read it or even knew what a balcony looked like. The famous balcony scene was put there later. Ah. Well, then wow. wherefore out Boom. thou Juliet, Boom. if not on a balcony? Boom. A window. A, win oh, a boring yeah. window. Yeah. Indeed. Just Verona again. So, have you seen or read Romeo and uh, Juliet? What do you think of uh, Shakespeare's play? I think Leonardo DiCaprio is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> In okay. the movie, they had guns well, actually, as well. actually, me too, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the truth came out. Okay. okay. So, we have a clear winner and contestant. Okay. Absolutely. She takes the position. So you I have mean, to she... play it safe, guys. You have to play it safe. I see, I see. <laughs> like, she's taking the position of the unbeatable Patricia and she's becoming the unbeatable Wendy. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay. You just lost another extra point. You are minus one now. <laughs> right. So how many points, points uh, does Wendy have? 15. 15 points. 15. But that's wow. not the funniest part. The funniest part is not the 15 points of Wendy, but the zero and zero guys. <laughs> Probably the I first time, I think. That, I love that it. I love sorry it. for them, right? You know what they say? The important thing is... Uh, participating <laughs> or winning? Was one A, B or C? <laughs> winning, participating or losing? <laughs> As Wendy. I mean. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. Uh, thank you all, Matthew, Danny, Wendy and uh, Sergi. See you next uh, time. And that brings us to the end of our show today. We'll be back next week. Uh, until then, you can check every episode of the Weekly Mag online and also follow our social media profiles. 
There you can post uh, your solution for Mario Sarah's guess word. The clue is ranges of mountains for prisoners. That's six letters, the solution on our show next Saturday. Until then, thanks for watching. Keep up your English and have a great week. Bye-bye.